Well, I've been wanting to make this video for a long time, but uh, I never was able to get around to it. And I figured since we're all self-quarantining, maybe this is the best time to do it. So for those who don't know, my name is Brennan Robito. I'm the director of the documentary Born to Fly, which is the, uh, the documentary about uh, the sport of pole vault and in particular Mondo Duplantis. A lot of the current subscribers of my YouTube channel will know what I'm talking about, but I'd like to reach out to uh, the fellow filmmakers out there. You know, making this documentary has been a solo endeavor. I've self-funded the whole thing, and for pretty much the entire time, it has been just me as a solo filmmaker out there shooting, which has caused me to, uh, or has forced me to build a rig uh, around that situation. And it's netted been a positive because it's allowed me to understand the camera fully, force myself to get into audio a bit, lighting of course, and just being able to get out there and shoot as a solo operator. Uh, while also directing, which is probably more of the challenging part. But today I wanted to talk about the camera rig that I was able to put together. I think it's not perfect yet, but it's something that has really evolved over time and allowed me to, I think now, be at a really good point where I can pretty much be dropped off and have everything I need in maybe one or two bags um, and allow me to shoot a full-fledged documentary. I'd like to say first and foremost that I absolutely got a lot of ideas for this rig from fellow filmmaker Julian Jari. He's a great filmmaker. He posts a lot on Instagram and uh, a bit on YouTube as well. His work is incredible. And he made a, a cinema rig breakdown for his FS7. And it had some great gems in it that I was able to take and utilize on mine. This actually wasn't the original setup, obviously. Like I said, this camera has evolved a lot. This rig has evolved a lot. And so for the first year and a half of filmmaking, of uh, certainly with the documentary, I was just shooting on the FS7, the top handle, no VCT plate, the kit lens, which is the 28 to 135, yeah, the 28 to 135 from uh, Sony, the standard EVF, and um, the standard handle, right? So, I mean, I had just the basic package whenever you bought it. And I was able to shoot like that with just these BPU batteries, you know, the I think I had the 60 series, and I just got the Wasabi, the off-brand batteries. Um, and with a 128 gigabyte card, I was able to shoot for a straight year and a half because the preamps in the FS7 are actually really, really good. So I was able to just run an XLR mic straight into it, put maybe a wireless mic on top if I needed, and I had a two mic system and that was good enough for literally a year and a half of the documentary. As time went on, of course, I needed to uh, expand it and make it a little bit better as well as bring in better audio options, stuff like that. So. I got the Sigma 18 to 35 on right now, and on on the lens, uh, on the focus gear, I'm using the, I believe it's called followfocusgears.com. Another thing, that's a tip from Julian Jari, fantastically uh, crafted. I think they're like $35 or a little bit less or more. They're very inexpensive, and they fit, you know, you can get it custom to the lens, so it's a nice seamless uh, follow focus gear. Now, I don't use a follow focus uh, Usually, but occasionally I will, and it's nice to have it just sitting on there. Plus, it gives you just a little something to grip onto, which I, I appreciate. And of course, it's color, custom fit. You just slide it on, and it's tight enough that it's not going to wiggle around. Really great product, and they're cheap, and they ship fast. So I would suggest it. Um, on top here, I just have a small rig cheese plate. A lot of what I have is small rig, I'll be honest, but I think they make good products, and they're cheap, uh, and you can work with them. So I have like the half cheese plate on top and that just gives me a couple extra mounting points it fits around the handle so i haven't had to change the original handle i like the original handle i like having the um the record button on top i haven't changed it i know a lot of people have put on their own custom one with like a nato rail which is fine and probably really sturdy and solid and feels good and gives you even more mounting points but i can't occasionally i'm carrying it down and it's just nice to have that uh start stop button you know on top I'm still using the standard EVF that comes with the FS7, but what I've changed is, is this piece here, which is the EVF arm. This is a small rig one as well. It's basically, it just has a, you know, a slot for a 15 millimeter rail, and then it's a NATO rail, uh, which then you can mount the, again, I'm going to put all this in the description, but it's got like a small rig NATO rail to 15 millimeter 90 degree mount which then you can take the original EVF and just slot it in. And that way you're not getting that like twisting thing. You know, like before it would always be turning because it was a circle on the original FS7 Mark I. 
but this allows it to where it's like gonna stay perfectly 90 degrees and then you could just now you just have to worry about the tilt and that's it additionally on the bottom of the camera i have the small rig uh shoulder vct plate or the shoulder uh the vct shoulder rig and then on the uh on the tripod i just have the small rig vct plate so that was actually really cheap compared to like what a vct plate normally costs and let me tell you it's I don't know why the other ones cost so much. This one's totally adequate. It's fine. It might be a little bit on the heavier side, but for the most part, it works well for me and I have no complaints. Of course, this allows me to then mount, it's got two uh, 15 millimeter rail mounts. I got some six inch small rig carbon fiber ones. Um, and I'm just using it for, on this lens specifically, I'm only using it for uh, a lens support, which on the 18 to 35, you don't really need lens support. The FS7 definitely has a weak lens mount, but it's not that weak that it can't handle the 18 to 35. I just do it for safety. Again, I'm hand holding a lot. I'm whipping this thing around. I just want it to be a little careful. Now, if I am going to use the bigger boy, you know, the 50 to 100, then I will definitely switch over to the 12 inch carbon fiber rods and then I will put on the lens mount for sure and then I'll also put on this uh whatever you call that the bone the small rig where it gives you two extra rosette mounts and that way I can mount the uh the handle a little bit further up again just allowing myself to get it in the position when I'm doing handheld work to be as ergonomic as possible proper for my back and we'll get to that in a little bit so working our way to the back here you can see I have the bright tangerine titan arm now that was a great suggestion by Julian Jari. Look, we all know these magic arms. We've had them, they come in a billion different brands and they're fine, they're cheap. You can get them for, you know, relatively inexpensive. Now I haven't had too many break on me. I just have them not be strong enough. I mean, that's just the reality. Unless you're holding like a very light thing with it, they're, they're not gonna be strong enough to hold it. This, however, is expensive as hell. This is like a $240 magic arm, which is, seems ridiculous and perhaps it even is but i have to say after getting it he's totally right i mean this thing is like built like a tank i'm never going to need another one to replace this if i need another one it'll just be because i liked it so much i want an extra one but i mean it's strong enough that this is essentially a handle for the fs7 now it's it's as strong as the handle that comes with it i mean i can pick up the camera just from this magic arm and it won't it won't flex at all now Differently though is I'm not using it for a monitor. You know, I know Julian has a great monitor setup, but for me, I just can't travel with a monitor. I don't have the space. And again, I'm trying to break it down to like one or two bags max. Okay. Because it's not just about traveling to the place. I'm usually riding in the car with my subject and it's just about how fast can I get all my stuff packed up and put in and not, uh, you know, be a nuisance to anybody. So I end up leaving the monitor at home normally because I just don't have time to set it up. I stick with just the EVF which means that I'm not using this for the monitor, but rather for the my sound devices Mix Pre 6 Mark II series. Um, and I'll get to that in one second, but before, you'll notice also that I'm not using a V-mount uh, attachment for the FS7. Again, I love the idea of a V-mount, and I've used a V-mount on the FS7, and you get so much extra time, plus the D-tab capabilities, and it's very, very convenient. I don't use the XDAC or the XDCA mount with the timecode input, because it's just so bulky, and they make smaller ones for V-mounts. And the only reason to get that is for time code, but now with tentacle syncs, which I have here, and I can talk about that, um, I don't really need it. You know, I can just use audio time code with the tentacle sync, and it's just so much smaller and easier. But again, for me, I can't have or carry a bunch of V-mounts in a bag, right? I need batteries that are this size, because even this little guy is, gives me like four hours for the camera. <laughs> so I was able to find these, which is the core uh, the core nano series, I believe. But the beauty of these is that they are the, the, you know, the Sony mount, and then they give you DTAP and USB capabilities. So, you know, it basically took what I like about these being small and then added DTAP, which is exactly what I needed. So I have that in here and that way I'm able to power the, I'm able to power the sound devices, uh, via, uh, via this cable, cable techniques. Yeah. Cable techniques. It's a Hirose or Hyros, uh, connection to DTAP and that way I can power it. I don't have to worry about changing the batteries because the battery, the battery situation is the one problem with the Mix Pre series. They're just weird. The four battery gives you like an hour. So that's nothing. The eight battery doesn't give you that much time. And then you got to carry around double A batteries. So many of them that it would just be a problem. And then the, the Sony L series mount is just so bulky and weird and plasticky and finicky that it's kind of just a mess. So I've chosen to go with this 
um, Hiroshi Hiros input straight to DTAP. That way I don't have to worry about any batteries. And all I got to do is worry about the one battery that's powering both the camera and the audio. And that's been really good for me. Additionally, it's got the USB port. So if I have, let's say, a Rode Wireless Go or something like that, and I want it to last all day, I can plug that from the USB-C straight into the USB port on the back of the battery and, you know, power that as well. And if I need any more DTAP, you know, I have this DTAP expander um, to give me extra ports. But as of right now, I don't actually need it. I just need the one DTAP on the back, and that's been very helpful. Okay, so why the uh, Mix Pre 6 Mark II? Well, it kind of acts as like a, a battery in a way. It helps me with the balance on the back of the camera. You know, this is where a V-mount would traditionally go. And since I want it to be mounted really well, putting it on this spot is perfect. Plus when I'm operating, I'm able to still access the knobs, which is why it's facing me and make sure I'm recording and whatnot. Um, I'm using Tentacle Sync to sync it from here to the uh, camera, as well as my second camera, which is what I'm shooting on now, the Sony a6600. Um, and you know, again, with Tentacle Sync, you can use audio time code. So even though the neither the A6600 or the FS7 accept traditional time code, I'm able to still sync up via time code. And it's very nice using the Tentacle Sync Studio. That's a topic for another day, but very helpful. But I like the uh, the Mix Pre series because of the 32-bit float and because of the analog preamps. Now, this is where my knowledge. Uh, becomes very limited. And I don't want to even pretend that I'm a sound mixer, sound designer, or someone that understands it fully. If you're really interested in that kind of stuff, I would head over to Curtis Judd, who makes some fantastic videos uh, and informative videos describing uh, pretty much everything that you would need to know about sound mixing and the sound gear that sound mixers choose. Um, so a lot of this is just advice that he has given and I'm trying to translate it, but again, I'm gonna make mistakes. Please go watch his videos. I'll try and keep what I say about sound limited because of how little I actually know about it, okay? But again, I'm a solo shooter. I have to be able to at least capture good quality audio by myself. If I could hire a sound mixer all the time, I of course would, but I can't. I actually don't use the 32-bit float that much because 24-bit on the Mix Pre series and the preamps are so good that even if you accidentally record too low, you've got a decent amount of room to increase it. Uh, but every once in a while, if I have to mic up like three people, three or four people, and I have to operate and I'm not able to control the gain smoothly, then 32-bit float is definitely a lifesaver in that realm. I don't like to use it all the time though because it is a bigger file size and it's not cheating by any means, it's just a tool. But uh, I just, you know, I wanna make sure that if I'm using it, I actually know what I'm doing. I feel like if I rely completely on 32-bit, then I'm not actually learning what I should be learning about my own equipment. Um, but it is definitely a tool to utilize uh, when, it, when need be. So again, that's how I'm powering it. I'm connecting my top shotgun mic, which is the Sennheiser ME66 slash K6. A pretty decent shotgun mic. Um, I would like to upgrade to the uh, MKH416, but that's what I have for right now. So I'm just phantom powering it via these really nice, if I can get them out, these really nice low profile XLRs. I forget who makes them, but I'll link to it. I think it's Cable Techniques again, actually. But you can see how small the, uh, the low profileness of it is. So you don't have this cable and the cable comes out the side. So you don't have this whole thing sticking out the bottom, getting in the way, especially if I set the camera down when I'm hand holding it. I don't want like cables sticking out and all that kind of stuff. Additionally, I'm sending out a stereo out feed into the FS7. So I have both time code and a stereo output so that I can, if anything fails, I at least have uh, the mix going into the FS7. Now let's talk about my wireless audio choices. And again, I'm gonna be very careful when I'm talking about this because I am not a sound mixer. I'm utilizing the Sennheiser G4 uh, series. And what I've done, and this is a, a tip that Julian had on his video, which I really, really enjoyed, is this uh, small rig little setup with a cold shoe mount. And I'll show how to do that in a close up. But basically it allows you to be able to mount this right on the side and give it enough clearance. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see from the front. It gives it enough clearance here on the side so that this isn't butting up against anything. And then I can just plug that in. I usually plug that one in with another low profile uh, XLR port to 3.5. And that goes right up there to the top on my uh, tube. 
Now, I'm actually using the one that goes here in this other cold shoe, but that's, I do have the uh, Rode Wireless Go as well. And I enjoy the Rode Wireless Go's a lot. And when you're that run and gun solo operator, sometimes you just need to throw on a mic and just walk away and it just work, you know? And you don't need it to necessarily transmit 200 feet. You just need it in this area. So for example, I'm actually using it right now, the Rode Wireless Go. And I'm using it with my Sankin uh, COS 11D. It's just taped straight to my chest going into the Rode Wireless Go as the uh, transmitter. So yeah, the Sankin COS 11D is the mic of choice now. It's not the mic I've always had. In fact, it's a pretty recent purchase. I, of course, have used the standard mics that come with the um, any of the Sennheiser gear. For example, this is the Sennheiser G4 transmitter, and I have the original mic, but man, that thing is fat and huge and sounds okay. It's fine. I mean, it's usable. Again, for me, it's... I'm solo shooting out there. If I can get audio, then I'm happy. If I can get anything that's decent quality audio, it's better than nothing. Uh, but the Sankin, the Sankin uh, Cost 11D has been a, an upgrade I've been needing to make uh, for a very long time, not just on the documentary side, but on my commercial production side as well. So I'm happy with the purchase. And um, it's, you know, it's been good for me to get that extra quality. And I can plug it into either the Wireless Go, the G4s, if I have to use the Sennheiser XSWDs, I'll use that as well as a backup. It can kind of be used on any of them. Or if you've got you know fancier transmitters and receivers, you can obviously plug it into those if you have the connection for it. So like I said before, I'm still utilizing the original handle. One of the things that I'm definitely gonna be upgrading soon is better grips uh, or better handles for when I'm going handheld. The only reason I have this still is because occasionally, like I said, I do utilize the 28 to 135 millimeter or the 18 to 110 millimeter Sony cinema lens, which allows me to have the zoom capabilities because again, I'm shooting at this point, I'm shooting a sports documentary and being able to zoom with a, a, a rocker is very convenient. Um, but I'm definitely getting more interested in potentially, uh, you know, like the, the Tilta Nucleus um, handles where I could have them out here in control focus again, because I have those follow the focus gears and just easily slap on a a follow focus controller, plug it in to the battery that I have now and everything can be powered and have no problem and utilize those handles as maybe even a focus and a zoom control and have a little bit more control. But one of the biggest things, one of the main upgrades I, uh, I did recently was I invested in the Ergo rig from Cinema Devices. Now, it was a debate for me depending uh, to decide on what I was gonna get, whether it was gonna be the Ergo Rig or the Easy Rig. And hopefully I don't make too much noise on the mic here. Um, ultimately, I decided on the Ergo Rig just based on the style of handheld shooting I do. I wanted something that looks a little bit better when walking. I noticed the Easy Rigs are really fantastic, but if you're trying to do walking movement, it kinda floats a little bit too much. And I wanted something that felt like a shoulder mount, you know? And so I ended up investing in the Ergo Rig Look, this thing is not cheap. I think it retails $18.50. It might be on sale right now at this moment. I was lucky enough to get it on sale for a group buy, but even then, I mean, we're talking over a thousand, probably over $1,500 even on sale. It's an expensive piece of kit, but I justified it because I spent, I don't know, four or $500 at a chiropractor last year, just based on poor body mechanics while I was shooting, or just based on when you're quick running gun and you're the solo shooter, you don't have the perfect opportunity to always be in the best position when operating and you're going to injure your back and I was having back problems and to me it's better to invest in this and extend my I think they call it the career extender and I really do believe in that it is a career extender and for me what's most important at the moment is just making sure that I'm keeping care of my body if I want to be a camera operator if I want to direct and utilize my body as a piece of the tool in my kit then you know I'm going to have to protect it a little bit better. So, again, this will kind of talk about the balance here. But for me, having this sit and having my EVF, I can even move it back now. See, that's the beauty of having one that's long enough is that it's actually now too far because this is pretty much perfectly balanced, right? And I'll even turn so you can see that I now have it sitting on top of the ergo rig, and I can let go. And it's essentially weightless at this point. I mean, I don't even feel the camera. 
So that's pretty much the rig setup that I have for uh, my independent documentary. Now, this rig is always evolving. I'm not saying it's perfect, by no means is it. And I constantly am finding little things here and there that I can fix that would make my life that much more efficient or that much more uh, simplified. So I'll post any updates that happen in the comments down below. But what you have to remember is, this is a rig that can kind of be tailored towards your budget and your camera of choice or whatever. But I can tell you right now that I've shot an entire feature documentary with this setup or less. In fact, this setup really is only the last six months and it's just progressively built up to this point. It's been less and less and less all the way down to the base FS7 package since the beginning. So it's definitely possible. I appreciate all of you guys watching. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below. I will definitely answer as many questions as I can. And again, I'll put all the links in the description of the equipment that I have here. People talk about you following your father's footsteps. Well, he's following his mom's footsteps. She grew up in the Swedish track tradition. You know, like I said, in the United States, you have to be 13. You could compete in pole vault when you're six years old in Sweden. Mondo said, yeah, let's do that. And once you make that move, that's it. Now he's a Swede.